We have a couple of guests here, uh, Ed Mast and Hannah Edie. I've known Ed for a long time, decades, actually. Like whenever I go to um, any kind of a Pal Palestine activism uh, event, you know, I see him and his wife, Linda. And uh, so maybe you can start talking about, uh, uh, you know, how you got into uh, being an activist for Palestine. Uh, I spent most of my life not knowing anything about Palestine, not knowing it was a place, not knowing what the word meant. I'll bet I was past 40 years old before I got to know somebody who was Palestinian and started to learn some stuff and was shocked both by the truth of the situation that is presented as complicated but is actually very simple and by how little I knew how much I personally had been fooled and had been accepting propaganda all of my life uh, and uh, that the situation was uh, reenacting what had happened to the indigenous population on this continent that it was happening before our eyes again uh, in what is now called Israel. And so I became interested to write about it and I traveled over there. And um, shortly after I got back through a mutual friend, um, uh, that mutual friend introduced me as a theater guy to a Palestinian theater guy that she knew and that turned out to be Hanna Edi. And we sat around with a couple of people and talked a little bit. And the next day, Hanna got my phone number and called me up and asked me if I'd be interested to uh, participate in the project that he was cooking up. And that was in 1995. I read a little bit about you, Hanna. And uh, you actually grew up in Northern uh, Israel, yeah. which was Palestine, obviously. And, uh, you know, so uh, you're a playwright also, which I want to talk about in a second. But, um, you know, uh, you've been studying theater and you came to the United States. Tell me a little bit about your uh, activism. I, I don't think <laughs> it's my life. Uh, I, I actually came to the U.S. Um, for school. You know, I wanted to study theater and for a Palestinian who's also an Israeli citizen, even at the time, I couldn't go to a theater school. At, at the time, uh, Haifa University didn't even have a theater department, but it was, uh, you know, doors were closed in our faces uh, as far as artists, you know, actors and directors and playwrights. Uh, it's a little bit different today. But, so at the time I thought, okay, well, I'll go to the US and, uh, and I wanted to leave the country because it started a war, invaded Lebanon, and we were very close to Lebanon, and we could just hear every bomb. And that's when my dad said, I think it's time for you to leave. So I came, and I actually was uh, sitting in classroom, imagining myself carrying every word that the professor would say, every word on, on the page that has to do with, with theater history and theater styles and that I would carry this and take it back home when I graduate, but that never happened. I um, somehow during this time discovered my identity, my true identity as, as a Palestinian, which was basically erased and, and, and destroyed by the Israeli propaganda at the time. And I was so angry and I decided not to go back. Um, I stayed, um, and I started a family and, and started a family with a Jewish wife. And it wasn't that easy actually to go back with a Jewish wife. Um, and since then I thought, okay, maybe I have a, a, a better mission uh, to, to carry on with it in the US, which is you know doing some theater work to educate the American public and uh, through theater. And that's when uh, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin and then moved to the University of Washington in the directing program. And soon after that, uh, I met Ed and, uh, and we did the play that uh, Ed just mentioned, uh, the first project together, uh, Sahmata, which is uh, the name of a destroyed village, uh, one of the Palestinian destroyed village in north of uh, Palestine. Um, 
right after the Oslo Accord. I, I remember being so frustrated after reading some of the items on the Accord, realizing that no mention to the refugees. Um, and I thought that was essential to any peace treaty that Palestinians would go home, they would return home. But that uh, was not part of the deal, obviously. And I thought, okay, maybe it's time to go and document some of these, uh, uh, the history of these villages. And when I came back with some videos, I sat down with Ed Master and we wrote Sahmata, a play that was uh, done here in Seattle in, C in English. And then I translated it back to Arabic and went back to Palestine uh, along with Ed. And we actually performed the play on the site of the village. Um, and it took on after that. I think it's been, what is it? Uh, 19 years, almost 20 years. <laughs> um, Four plus. Yeah. You've uh, made this uh, film we're going to show today, but uh, you made it on Zoom, you know, but it's, it, is, it is a play, you know, and um, this production company you have now, uh, Dunya, um, Dunya. Is this just something you just recently started? Yeah. Uh, I think I was in touch with Ed about how to go about it. And that was maybe, if I'm not mistaken, Ed has a better memory when it comes to this, maybe around November of last year. And then I left to Palestine, came back, and just made a few phone calls to gather around the idea some new talent. And we were uh, surprised to see that there's a little bit more now. <laughs> Uh, than, than 15 or 20 years ago in Seattle. There's some new talent, some of them actually working with Seattle Rip, some of them are just waiting for somebody to tap into their talent to ask them to join uh, such uh, company. Uh, Dunya Productions, we are a group of uh, uh, mostly Middle Eastern, you know, Lebanese, Palestinians, Egyptian, uh, and, and uh, Ed Mast and Jane Marlowe, who are Americans. And, um, and obviously we, we, we started and then we took a long pause before the, because of the, the coronavirus. Um, but we've been trying to do it uh, virtually to prepare for the time when we can actually do it um, live with, with a real audience. If you are watching us from Palestine, and Sabah al Khair if you are in the US, and Ahlan wa Sahlan if you are watching us from anywhere around the world, and Ramadan Kareem. My name is Hanna Aidi. Um, I am with uh, Dunya Productions. We're based here in Seattle. We are a group of uh, very talented theater artists and activists. Uh, locally here in Seattle. Uh, this program is about Palestine. It's about the West Bank. It's about Gaza. And these are uh, letters that we're going to be reading for you that we have received from uh, friends and families and collected from uh, Palestine, which is the least we could do here at Dunya. Uh, to give voice to our people who are living under occupation in Palestine. We hope that by the end of this pandemic, people around the world will pay a little bit more attention to the ongoing 72 years old 
of injustice and uh, humanitarian crisis in, in Palestine. Uh, this program is about 20 minutes of reading these letters, uh, performers by artists and uh, talented people here at Dunya. Uh, and we also have a special guest with us, uh, Ramzi Baroud, who will be updating us on the situation in Palestine and also answering uh, questions uh, and any comments that uh, you will be uh, making. And with that, uh, Dunya Productions presents, um, I give you letters from Palestine in the time of the virus. Bethlehem is like a ghost town. People are staying indoors. At the Natural History Museum, we met with health officials. We took precautions as needed, but work must go on. Animals have to be fed at the museum garden. Chickens, peacocks, rabbits, hamsters, hawk, fish. So we come every day. Many staff and volunteers work from home. Some of our activities are on hold and money is tight. For most of the people of Bethlehem, this lockdown is hardly their first. Lockdowns and curfews were the status quo in the city during the long years of the second intifada. Whether our Israeli neighbors know or care, we have been through some of this before. We have worked from home, we did homeschooling, our sports leagues were frozen, we could not travel, and we were afraid of leaving our houses. Today, I could write a whole book on how we help each other. Not just medical personnel, but police, shop owners, owners of restaurants, and many others who work silently. People donate food, medicines, money, and so forth to help those in quarantine or families of those infected. As of last night, our town of Beit Zahur is under complete curfew. Even shopping for food is prohibited. The emergency committee stated that we can call shops for home delivery. I'm not sure how that would work out since most people need money, which they do not have. And if they do have, it is in the bank and they would need to go to ATMs, which are prohibited. And the banks are closed in the Bethlehem district, so they cannot restock the ATM machines. I also would like to check on needy people and help them, but I have to figure out how we can do that under complete curfew. Staff are all at home and we try to do work, though psychologically it is challenging, but we must keep our spirits up. Israel is taking this opportunity to continue its ethnic cleansing and apartheid. Their occupation army even came into Bethlehem dressed in full protective corona gear and arrested three people from their homes. The virus is official in Gaza, where our hospitals are already short on vital medicine and equipment, and people are crowded in like sardines. We've been banned from traveling for 14 years. Cleanliness is difficult when water supplies are contaminated and garbage collection doesn't exist. I have lived all of my 22 years in the tiny besieged Gaza Strip. I have never been allowed to leave. This is the only place I've ever known. I grew up with war, occupation, oppression, and conflict. How could this be worse? But when my 73-year-old uncle refused to shake my hand during a visit, I began to think this might be a different kind of threat. It was almost 1 a.m. when I read the news. The Gaza had identified its first two coronavirus victims. My heart beat rapidly and fear flushed like ice water through my body. I continued to read, but my eyes teared up and everything looked blurred like a gauzy curtain had suddenly dropped down. I attempted to blink the tears out of my eyes and continue reading. Those two people had returned to Gaza from Pakistan. And although all travelers have immediately been quarantined, no one here trusts that this has kept the infection contained. I was riding in a taxi and the driver remarked on how much his passenger load had already declined with just the fear of the virus hanging over the strip. He was almost in tears when he told me that he had kids, and if he doesn't work every day, he won't be able to feed them. 
My father works as a fabric seller and deals with people all day. His shop is our family's main source of income and each day makes a difference. What if we stay home and get infected by the tap water? If the virus enters Gaza, it will be like throwing a gas canister inside a closed room. Everyone inside will breathe it. Infection does not necessarily mean death everywhere, but in Gaza it could be. If one of my kids got infected and no one could help them, only because we are under siege in Gaza, I will lose faith in everything. There are many people who are homeless. Some families are living in a room which they made with some tools which is not safe for saving you from the coronavirus. Those people don't have their basic needs met and they are living beside tons of garbage mountains. For a while there was talk on social media about the benefits of the siege, which I found sort of shocking. Yes, the blockade helped prevent COVID-19 from invading Gaza for days and weeks. But realistically, it was just a matter of time. And this blockade is the reason hundreds and maybe thousands of people here have died because they couldn't get access to proper medical treatment. My own mother has suffered severe pain from trigeminal neuralgia. And while treatments are available elsewhere that could bring her relief, she has no access here. She has told me so many times she'd just rather die. The blockade also is the reason hundreds of Palestinian youths have lost arms and legs in the Great Return March, punished by snipers for protesting their imprisonment. It is the reason why hundreds of extraordinary students lost opportunities to study at foreign colleges and universities because they could not travel. It is the reason why talented Palestinian athletes and artists cannot participate in international workshops and competitions. And it is the reason why our economy is so sick and our unemployment rate is the highest in the world, 70% among young people. The Israeli blockade of Gaza may have protected it temporarily, but now it will prevent us from caring properly for our people. More people will get infected and Gaza will become the world's latest hotspot for coronavirus cases and deaths. And once the world finally gets a vaccine for the virus, Gaza will be the last to get it. When you see pictures of cities with their famous streets empty, remember the Palestinian refugee camps in Gaza and think about what they call their fertile alleyways. I was raised in one of those refugee camps in Rafa called Block J. Nothing in my language can quite describe what the word camp means to me. On one hand, it's the home where I grew up, the place I associate with my friends and neighbors, and the site of the lone fig tree planted by my beloved grandfather, may he rest in peace. But on the other, there is a lack of sunshine due to the closeness of the dull gray concrete walls, the mud in the unpaved alleyways in between because leaking sewage pipes hang overhead, and people peddling everything from Twinkies to tissue in those very same streets, despite the crowding, because that is the only way they can eke out a living. Imagine telling them they must maintain six feet between them if COVID-19 invades. How would they even do that when their homes are so close together with an average of seven people in one 1,500 square foot space? Where will people be isolated? In homes where seven people share a small room without ventilation, without a sink or toilet? And imagine what those other countries would do if they had to manage through this crisis while being controlled by an occupying power, in our case, Israel. In some ways, the coronavirus is like the Israeli army. They both attack innocent people. They both randomly and unexpectedly hit areas heavily populated by civilians. They both scare people and steal their lives. Which is worse? 
For me, living through an Israeli escalation is much worse. It's more lethal. The Israeli army targets people of all ages and health, buildings, animals, plants, yet the response of the world to the two crises differs dramatically. To the virus, a full-out global mobilization. To Israel's attacks on Gaza, almost no response at all. In Gaza, staying at home isn't enough to protect you. Israeli missiles can just as easily find you there. In Gaza, the first 23 years of my life were lived in virtual lockdown. My father's quarantine was experienced much earlier, as did his father's shelter in place before him. They both died and were buried in Gaza's cemeteries without ever experiencing true freedom outside of their refugee camp in Gaza. As a child, I learned to listen intently to orders barked out by Israeli military officers as they swept through our refugee camp in Gaza, declaring or easing military curfews. Every day, 10 or 15 minutes after the nightly curfew set in, we would hear crackling and hissing of bullets as they whistled through the air from various distances. Automatically, we would conclude that someone, a worker, a teacher, or a rowdy teenager, missed his chance by a few minutes and paid the price for it. Now that nearly half of the population of planet Earth are experiencing some form of curfew or other, we have a few suggestions on how to survive the package, the prolonged confinement, the Palestinian way. Always think ahead and prepare for a longer lockdown than the initial one declared by your city or state. Whenever the Israeli army killed one or more refugees, we knew in advance that mass protests would follow. Thus more killings. In these situations, a curfew was imminent. Number one priority was to ensure that all family members congregated at home or stayed within close proximity so that they could rush in as fast as possible when the caravan of Israeli military jeeps and tanks came thundering, opening fire at anyone or anything within sight. Stay calm. Take control of the situation, do not panic, and assign specific responsibilities to every family member. This strengthens the family unit and sets the stage for collective solidarity desperately required under these circumstances. Typically, my mother would come in, rational and calculating. She would storm the kitchen and assess what basic supplies were missing, starting with the flour, sugar, and olive oil. Knowing that the first crackdown by the Israelis would be on water supplies and electricity, she would fill several plastic containers of water, designating some for tea, coffee, and cooking, and others for dishes and washing clothes. Per her orders, we would rush to nearby stores to make small but necessary purchases, batteries for the flashlight and the transistor radio, cigarettes for my dad, and a few VHS videotapes, which we would watch over and over again whether the crew fee lasted for a few days or a few weeks. Preserve your water. It is easy to feel invincible and fully prepared on the first day of quarantine or military curfew. Many times we live to regret that false sense of readiness as we drank too much tea or squandered our dishwashing water supplies too quickly. Cautiously use your water supplies during quarantine and never under any circumstances drink rainwater or at least keep diarrhea, diarrhea pills handy. Ration your food. Agree in advance on what classifies as essential food and consume your food in a rational way. Also, if you are lucky enough to locate Dutch candy in whatever version of the Abu Sadad store in your town, do not gamble it away in stupid games with your brothers all in one day. Have more than one form of entertainment and be prepared for every eventuality, including at power outages as a form of collective punishment. If electricity is cut off, be ready with alternative options. Books, free wrestling, living room soccer, with the ball preferably made from stuffed up socks contributed by all family members. And of course, candy poker.
Find the humor in grim situations. Be funny, don't take life too seriously, share a laugh with others, and let humor inject hope in every hour and every day of your quarantine. Gaza is locked up so tight, even a virus can't get it. Gaza is so poor, even a virus would run away scared. During curfew is when you need your sense of humor most. Take things lightly. Laugh at your miserable situation if you must. Forgive yourself for not being perfect, for panicking when you should have been composed, or for forcing your younger brother to gamble his underwear when he runs out of Dutch candy. Let your values guide you during your hours of loneliness. In curfews, we developed a different relationship with God. God became a, a personal and more intimate more intimate companion as we often prayed in total darkness, whispered our verses so very cautiously as not to be heard by pesky soldiers. And even those who hardly prayed before the curfew kept up with all five prayers during the lockdown. What we do have in Gaza is a strong social fabric that holds us together. Our families, our faith, rituals, and traditions, this season, it feels like the generosity of Ramadan is magnified. Despite the risks, youth groups are redoubling their efforts to help families hardest hit. One group contributed their own money and distributed 100 food parcels during the first days of Ramadan. I stand at the balcony singing, we are here. We are here for all of us. That's why we're here. I close my eyes and imagine a friend at the balcony in the city of Milan. Our souls are brought together so we can love each other. Brother, I see my friends Pam and Kevin in the USA at their balconies. Ignore what Trump says. Sing, we are here. We are here for all of us. My friends from Switzerland and Germany, Basel and Frankfurt are singing. Let's talk about our part. My heart touching your heart. Let's talk about living. I've had enough of dying. That's not what we are all about. According to the World Health Organization, 97% of all Gaza's water is not fit for human consumption. Even when it is available, doctors and nurses are unable to sterilize their hands because of the water quality. There are only 62 ventilation devices across Gaza, more than two thirds of which are already used by other patients. There are only two test kits, enough to examine 190 people. It was five years ago that the United Nations predicted Gaza would be uninhabitable by 2020. The truth is, no amount of preparedness in Gaza, or frankly anywhere in occupied Palestine, can stop the spread of the coronavirus. What is needed is a fundamental and structural change that would emancipate the Palestinian healthcare system from the impact of the Israeli occupation and the Israeli government's policies of perpetual siege and politically imposed quarantines, also known as apartheid. Looking around us, Gazans see people all over the world experiencing what we live every day. Mandatory isolation, unemployment, poverty, rampant illness and death. We take no joy in that. Only hope that once the coronavirus passes and life around the world returns to normal, that people will remember Gaza, still occupied, still isolated, but perhaps no longer forgotten. I hope that under no circumstances you will ever hear these ominous words, you are now under curfew, anyone who violates orders will be shot immediately. I also hope that this COVID-19 quarantine will make us kinder to each other and will make us emerge from our homes better people, ready to take on global challenges while united in our common faith, collective pain, and a renewed sense of love for en our environment. And when it's all over, think of Palestine.
for her people have been quarantined for 71 years and counting. like to mention, um, just to give a credit to the poet who sent me the poem that I sang in the beginning, uh, Palestinian poet Hossein Mohanna from Palestine. Thank you, actors and readers. Um, we wanted to uh, move on to the discussion and get an update uh, from Palestine. And um, at this time, if you want to act on your concern for the Palestinian people in the time of the virus, we would uh, would like you to go to the website. We've uh, uh, set up a donation site for direct relief to families in Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the West Bank. Um, we're working with Salam Cultural Museum and Donkey Saddle Projects to get funding to some organizers uh, that we know. These are people that we trust uh, to distribute packages of food and necessities to families in need, including families of those in quarantine in Gaza during the pandemic. Um, so if you, if you care to donate, 100% of the fund donated to this small scale volunteer project will directly go towards these vital provisions. Uh, we're basically thanking you for, uh, on behalf of the people of, uh, of Palestine. Um, so now it, it's time to, get an update from Palestine. It, I guess your questions would be to our guest, who is uh, Ramzi Baroud. Ramzi Baroud is also one of the contributors to the letters that we, uh, we read. Uh, Ramzi Baroud is a journalist and an editor of uh, the Palestine Chronicle. He's the author of five books. His latest is These Chains Will Be Broken, Palestinian Stories of struggle and defiance in Israeli prisons. Uh, Dr. Baroud is a non-resident senior research fellow at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs, uh, Istanbul Ziam University. Uh, you can also get to his website, ramzibaroud.net, uh, to learn more about him. Uh, so at this time, I would like to welcome Ramzi. Ahlan, uh, Ramzi, can you please uh, maybe just start briefly with an update about the situation in Palestine as you know it from friends and, and family that you have. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hannah. Uh, first of all, for that impressive performance. Um, I was going to ask you about who is the poet, um, and now you told us. So thank you for that. And, um, and also for all the artists and the readers and the, the beautiful contributions and the way that they have been arranged uh, very beautifully by Ed. Uh, really very touching. I think, um, um, you know, just just hearing all of these um, uh, beautiful contributions, I, I feel like we are caught in this same old paradigm of, of the, you know, as uh, Antonio Gramsci put it, once as the, um, the pessimism of the intellect, the optimism of the will. You know, this idea that um, no matter how bad things can possibly get, 
uh, under no circumstance are we planning to give up or give in. And there is always a reason to hope and there is always a reason to wake up in the morning and there is always a reason to move forward. Uh, and I think, um, you know, we're, we're talking about donating and all of that. And I think it is so very important for people to kind of be part of this project by, by making a contribution, <clears throat> by showing an act of solidarity, what you are essentially doing is that you are telling the people in Gaza, the people throughout Palestine, you are on, not on your own. We are all one family and we are all going to be part of this. We are going to get through this together. That's the message. So this is not about money and charity per se. It's about solidarity. It's absolutely essential um, at this time. Of course, the situation in Palestine in, 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 you know, is, is, is the, this constant state of arrested development. Sometimes you feel like things are moving forward, but at the end of the day, you look back and you realize that very little has changed. <clears throat> we know that there is uh, a national government uh, now in Israel that is a national unity government, and it's bringing the worst in Israeli society, the most militant, the most Zionist, the most racist, uh, of the Israeli political elites uh, come, came together to isolate Arab parties and to come up with this new sinister agenda regarding Palestine. In some strange way, I think if it were not for the coronavirus, um, I think Israel would have went to war against Gaza immediately because if there was anything in that, that Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu had in common throughout this whole year a plus of campaigning, is that they were keen on attacking Gaza. Gantz wanted to teach Gaza a lesson. The, uh, strangely enough, he was calling uh, Netanyahu weak for not uh, uh, cracking uh, down harder on Gaza, not going to an, uh, a, a, even a more destructive war than the previous one and the previous one and the previous one and so forth. Um, regarding the coronavirus, uh, Gaza is still struggling uh, with very little supplies being allowed in. Uh, an Israeli minister, uh, strangely enough, minister of justice, made it clear that uh, coronavirus kits, testing kits and such will not be allowed to Gaza without political concessions uh, from uh, the uh, Palestinian authorities in the Strip. Now, if this happened anywhere else in the world, it, it would definitely be a, a political crisis. Some people would be forced to answer some serious questions it will be headline news everywhere that you have a nation that is under this perpetual siege, still reeling from the effect of civil destructive wars, where you have hospitals that are running out of equipment, uh, and a region that virtually has no electricity, no clean water, and for a leader of a supposedly democratic country to come and make that sort of exchange. But that's where the optimism of the will comes in. When I talk to family in Gaza, when I see photos coming from uh, friends uh, in Gaza, there is a, a lovely photographer, Fawzi Muhammad, has been sending us at the Palestine Chronicle so many beautiful photos that shows that despite of all of this, somehow uh, people are, are in, in, you know, just living their everyday life despite of the abnormality uh, and, 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 and the pain and the hurt and the loss and the tragedy of it all. Uh, pictures of a, of a father who is, a, who is a, a performer, dressed up like a clown, entertaining his children, uh, a family of, of, uh, of uh, karate instructors uh, bringing their children together with the entire neighborhood, watching from the rooftops of nearby buildings, uh, uh, and, and, and they are carrying on with their karate performance. Um, charity carries on unabated coronavirus or not, people find ways to contribute and to help one another. And in, in, in my opinion, this is what makes Gaza, what makes all of Palestine, in fact, so unique. And this is the real reason of why, after all of these years and all of these wars, Israel still cannot break the will of the Palestinians. Uh, so there is a question, uh, do you know if there is uh, the same argument in Gaza about quarantine versus reopening stores? Uh, meaning, um, are they um, debating in Gaza whether they should open stores or not? I'm not 
certain what is the meaning of the question. Um, uh, yes, of course, there is the, the issue of, I mean, we know that unemployment in Gaza is 50%. That is according to the World Bank. Unemployment among the youth is 70%. Um, so you have this situation where you have this kind of several layers of quarantine and, and, and siege. Uh, because the situation in Gaza was very grim to begin with. People were unemployed before unemployment became a global uh, uh, issue. Uh, and now uh, on top of this, uh, um, there is the issue of the fact that those, the few who have been employed, many of them are now un unable to make living, especially those who are running small businesses and stores and such. And as one of the texts that was uh, read by your uh, lovely artists before and performance, it talks about how the, and, and I've witnessed that in Gaza in my last visit, uh, where you have uh, this army of children who um, do not go to school, they are walking around uh, Gaza barefoot, is selling cigarettes and newspapers and candies and offering to wipe, you know, windshield wipers and that sort of thing. And, and, and you know, sadly, a lot of these families are actually dependent on the income coming from these children. Uh, and many of them now cannot do so and this is, and, and and even if they brave going to the street they can't find customers anymore so of course there is a, a very major issue and i think for some people they would rather to take the risk with the coronavirus uh, than to actually uh, stop making living altogether thank you ranzi we have another question here can you speak about how the siege has impacted the medical system Right, so again, this is a situation that is already terrible and now it's a lot worse. Um, in, in one of the articles that were cited, it's research we've done about uh, how the quality of water in Gaza has affected hospitals. I mean, this is just not to say anything about everything else, about the electricity, the lack of equipment, the machines that are broken and they have not been prepared, doctors who are not able to to, to acquire, uh, uh, you know, and to further their research and acquire better uh, education, that sort of thing. And now you have the issue even of water itself. 97% of it is not clean, so that to the point that the doctors and the nurses cannot fully prepare for surgery and for the work that they do. And now on top of this, you have the coronavirus. Um, I know that there have been a lot of initiatives from fantastic people all over the world, especially coming from France and 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 England who are trying to get there, trying to provide help and machinery and equipments and that sort of thing. And sadly, they have been blocked. They are either blocked by the Israelis or blocked by the Egyptians who are using this as an opportunity to acquire political capital and concession from the Palestinians. So the situation is, is absolutely terrible as far as the medical uh, uh, healthcare system is concerned. And just a very quick, uh, thing I had this uh, good friend of mine, he's one top surgeon in France, and he, he went to Gaza and he said, we want to teach Gazan doctors how to be better doctors, how to deal with the, with the situation during the previous war. And he said, we were absolutely shocked to see how incredible these doctors are, how they managed to turn this, this uh, uh, as, you know, the, the very few tools that they have to make miracles in saving lives. So it's not like Gazan doctors and nurses and Palestinian doctors and nurses in general, they are not capable of handling this. They are, they are just not allowed, disbarred from having the proper equipments and facilities and even you know, clean water to carry on with their jobs. Thank you, Ramzi. Do you know how many cases and how many deaths have happened in Gaza because of the coronavirus? Well, for a while we were getting um, some, some good updates, especially after the two Pakistani uh, uh, or the Palestinian students returned from Pakistan. And, and, and you know, at one point we, um, we learned that there was, uh, you know, the, the number of cases that existed in Gaza and, and in the area of Beit Lahem uh, and Beit Sahur, uh, in the West Bank in particular, but in the last few weeks, I think there has been a dearth uh, in the number of cases. And I can explain that, uh, or dearth in terms of updates, and I can explain that at least in the case of Gaza. A few weeks ago, uh, Israel um, uh, has provided 
uh, Gaza with 200 testing kits. Of course, they ran out of these testing kits in no time, um, which meant that the many Gazans who were uh, uh, either uh, uh, diagnosed to have coronavirus uh, or uh, or they were suspected to have COVID-19, they were quarantined, but they were not able to leave the quarantine. So you have hundreds of people in Gaza who are quarantined, but they can't get out because they haven't yet tested negative because there are no testing kits. So you could have, you, 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 we're talking here about the possibility that there are numerous cases, uh, whether they are uh, uh, hidden or known, that, that, we, that, that Gazan authorities cannot deal with simply because there are not the, the proper testing facilities and testing kits. Thank you, Ramzi. I have another question here. Um, what are the ways, what ways are political processes moving forward during this pandemic? Annexation, like home demolitions, settling, settlement buildings, big peace process? Right. So, of course, there is no peace process. That is something of the past. And, and I don't think there has been any real intentions of, of regenerating that so-called peace process uh, uh, in the first place. What is there is an Israeli-American process where the Palestinians are excluded. International law doesn't exist and doesn't factor in in this so-called process whatsoever. Uh, the, the process is really uh, an exchange, a political uh, discussion that is happening between uh, the United States, uh, the Donald Trump administration, and Israel with the, this uh, new government of when do we annex? When do we have the green light to annex over a third of the West Bank and the entirety of the Jordan Valley? Uh, when is it not politically uh, inconvenient for us to do so? So I think the question of annexation has already been settled in the minds of the Americans, in the minds of the uh, Israelis. The Americans are a little bit contradictory regarding this. Pompeo made it clear a few uh, weeks ago when he said, this is an Israeli matter. You annex whenever you want to annex. And of course, the Palestinians are demonized, excluded, uh, and, and uh, uh, attacked at, at every possibility, as if it's the Palestinian leadership, not the Israeli occupation, not the Israeli apartheid, not the American complete disrespect and disregards for international law that pushed us to this point. It is as if the Palestinian uh, leadership and Palestinians in general who are responsible for all of this. So this is where the so-called uh, process is going. And, and, and I think it's really the matter of time before annexation becomes a reality. Um, I have another question for you. Thank you, Ramzi, for that one. Can you share your opinion about the most effective use of our resources during this time, where to put our time, attention, and the final financial resources? Uh, is, that, is that in regarding to Palestine or in general? For Gaza. For Gaza, of course. So um, I, I believe that um, uh, what Gaza needs at this moment, they need uh, more than... Um, uh, the immediate food supplies and that sort of thing, which is absolutely essential. They need the kind of tools that would allow them to survive. Uh, we know that the United Nations have already designated that in 2020, Gaza will become uninhabitable. Now we are already in 2020, we are midway there. I was never really expected that the UN is going to come and declare okay, here we are, Gaza is uninhabitable. It's not going to happen this way because if you make that declaration, what does it mean practically? Are you calling for the two million people of Gaza to leave Gaza, to venture out to Sinai, what to do exactly? So we, but, but we understand that it is. And I made the argument that it has already been uninhabitable many years ago because you can't possibly cram two million people within this you know, uh, uh, 360 square kilometers and, and, and dump all sorts of weapons and white phosphorus and all sorts of illegal, uh, experiment all sorts of illegal weapons on them, starve them, prevent them from moving and leaving and coming back and living an ordinary life and to claim that Gaza at any point was, uh, was actually anything but uh, inhabitable. But that said, uh, the biggest crisis in Gaza right now is a crisis uh, within the medical uh, uh, healthcare facilities, uh, within the water supplies, and uh, electricity. Uh, if 
uh, any any kind of support, any kind of help, any kind of expertise uh, that it, that would allow Gaza to function as far as these three elements are concerned, I think it would be absolutely essential to the survival uh, of Gaza and to the steadfastness of the people in Gaza. Thank you, Ramzi, again. Uh, <clears throat> do you know, is the border with Egypt open and if so, are the medical supplies being sent and test kits to Gaza? Unfortunately, the, the, the border with Gaza is, uh, the status quo ante of the border is it's shut down until further notice. This is why every few weeks, every couple of months, you know, it is big news in Palestine, in Gaza, in Palestinian media, where they say the border is going to be open for two days or for three days. And sometimes it doesn't actually, that doesn't end up happening anyway. It ends up opening maybe for a day, a day and a half, and it, it's shut down again. So uh, the openness of the, of the border is not uh, a permanent uh, state. Uh, I know of very little that actually gets through that border, through Egypt uh, or uh, uh, to, to, to Gaza. I think the, uh, the best way of actually trying to arrange any sort of support to Gaza happens through UNRWA uh, and through other uh, uh, international uh, institutions, uh, through other uh, uh, embassies that, uh, that, that coordinate with Cairo in advance or with Israel in advance where uh, supplies can arrive either through the Rafah border or through the Eretz uh, 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 Thank you, Ramzi. I think that's all the questions that we have. Okay, thank you, Manal. I think um, we can wrap it up now. <laughs> Thank you, Ramzi. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you, performers, all the actors and readers. Um, we hope uh, you will look us up, Dunya Productions, on Facebook and on our website. We uh, already have decided and chosen two full-scale productions, though the timeline is, is uncertain right now. Um, Nubian Stories is the first one by Nabra Nilsson, um, one of our readers uh, that you just watched. Uh, and the second show would be The Return by Hanna Aidi, myself, and Ed Mast, Edward Mast. Um, and uh, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Nabra to give us maybe a brief description of uh, Nubian Stories. Nabra, Baddali. Thank you, Hanna. Um, and thank you, Ramsey, so much for that discussion. Uh, Nubian Stories is a one-woman show that was written by me and my mom, Mona Sharif Nelson, who, uh, it's, it's a mix of ancient Nubian folkloric tales that my mom uh, grew up with in the village of Abu Simbel in the south of Egypt, and my mom's true life story uh, from her childhood in the old village to the displacement of her people by the intentional flooding of uh, her village and most of Egyptian Nubia by the construction of the Aswan High Dam, to her travels around the world and her very controversial romance with my, my father, who is an American man. Um, so it's a story about loss and legacy um, and the importance of storytelling. Our intention is to build towards a living room production um, run. So we would be bringing this to your living rooms and you'd be going into people's living rooms and hearing a very intimate story uh, that's meant to be told um, in that very intimate setting to a small group of people while you're eating and chatting and meeting uh, your community. So when we're able to be back in community, it'll be a lovely way to bring people really close back into community and storytelling. Thank you, Nabra. Uh... Okay, uh, so that's basically our program for today. And look for our upcoming Dunya Productions. And thank you again for joining us today and goodbye.
So uh, this video you know, was actually uh, made a couple of weeks ago. So um, now <laughs> things are changing so fast. I wonder if there's uh, any uh, updates that you would like to give. The most recent update I got uh, was Saturday morning from my son who lives there. He teaches there. He actually lives in my village with uh, with my mom. And he told me things are going back to normal very slowly in, Pal in, in Israel, within Israel territory. Um, they're allowing, you know, a group of 50 people. Some restaurants are opening soon. But within the territories, uh, all I'm getting is that they are still, you know, getting some coronavirus uh, infected cases in, in, in Gaza. Uh, new ones, new cases. Um, and the same with, uh, with, the, with the West Bank, some, in some of the camps. But I don't know the numbers, very few pieces of information coming from there. I don't know if Ed has any updates. Uh, I, just, I just got... Uh... Uh, an update from Gaza, which is the number of tested cases has gone up to about 50. But my understanding is that those are still in quarantine. Uh, and as Ramzi Baroud was informing us, they have over 100 people. Anybody who comes in before they close the borders is in quarantine. And because they are lacking the equipment and lacking the tests, that's all they can do. But they've been doing some testing. So the number of cases have gone up. But so far, as far as they can tell, that is all happening in quarantine. So it's not, there's no evidence that it's spreading like wildfire in Gaza yet, which is, is a great update. Yeah, well, they're smarter than our uh, political leadership right now, obviously. Yes. <laughs> so, okay, well, uh, I think that's probably all we got time for. Um, thank you so much for, uh, you know, your, your activism over the years, and thanks for so, so much for making this, this uh, play.